All right. Uh, yes, uh, we always have this uh, with a little exclamation mark. And uh, the idea is that uh, you should uh, just take this as a snapshot of uh, what's possible and what's accurate at this point in time, and uh, that you should always uh, get a second pair of eyes on anything, especially anything that requires professional attention. Uh, but that's common sense, but uh, we do like to say that up front. Uh, next slide, please. All right, uh, let me introduce the society very quickly. Uh, you see our board member, uh, Eugene, uh, from our last uh, summit uh, pictured there. Next slide. Um, we started this uh, almost a year ago. Uh, we've got a summit, our first summit since we incorporated uh, coming up in September. Uh, look out for our newsletter if you subscribe to our mailing list. Uh, our vision and mission and value proposition are here and uh, they will be uh, immortalized on our website, of course. Uh, we really look for people to join our society and to uh, buy a membership and to join our committees and to bring our three business lines to life, which is to say awareness of everything open data in Canada, uh, advocacy for open data publication and usage, uh, and assemblies, which is to say events like this one and the Canadian Open Data Summit. We like to think we provide very good value for money and uh, that it is a cause uh, most noble. So please do consider us and get in touch with me afterwards if you have any questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, next slide. And I'll uh, be happy to introduce our presenter, Michael Zusev, uh, founding member of the Canadian Open Data Society. Uh, in that, uh, he joined us very early on. Uh, anybody who joins in the first year is a founding member for life, uh, so that distinction will be uh, Michael's, uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, he's gone way above and beyond the call of duty here. Uh, as a business intelligence analyst, he's become quite the asset to the society, and uh, uh, this is a presentation that I've been looking forward to for a long time. Uh, next slide. And Mike, uh, you can take it away from here. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Paul. I'm really excited to be here. I'm very passionate about open data and doing good stuff with data. Uh, you know, I also think it's really important for our, our democracy that Canadians have an opportunity to be data literate and build these basic data skills. I think data can be a really powerful tool in our civic sphere, and I think it's important to spread that knowledge, uh, and which I think can sometimes seem a little too technical or daunting but I want everyone to rest assured, I'm someone with no formal training in programming or computer science. And I learned from very amazing online community. And that's why I'm here. I wanna pass that on to others. So this webinar is going to be aimed at total beginners, uh, not just in R, but in programming in general. I wanna show you that you don't need a computer science degree to do some really amazing stuff with open data and visualization. I'm going to uh, split up this presentation up into roughly two parts. So the first part is going to describe what is R and its ecosystem. I'm going to introduce you to the, uh, uh, to the concept of packages and introduce you to some really useful ones that we'll, we'll go uh, through in detail. Uh, I'm then going to introduce a data set that I've chosen to visualize for the second part of today's webinar, where I'll give you some hands-on demonstration of going from downloading an open data set from StatsCan, importing into R, cleaning it, and then visualizing it. Uh, so if you are comfortable, you can try and go ahead and follow along with me at that point, and I'll have some instructions on how you can use our Studio Cloud to do that. And I think those instructions were sent um, before this session, but if you haven't had a chance to take a look at that yet, no worries, you could just watch me. Uh, there's a lot here, and I'm gonna be honest, I may not have a chance to get through everything planned today, I really hope I am, but, and I may be going a little too fast for beginners, but please do not fear, it takes a little bit of practice to understand some of these concepts, but like I said, you don't need an advanced degree in statistics to get started, there are a lot of great resources online to master the concepts I'll be introducing you today. Uh, so like I've said, I've provided some material uh, before the session. I encourage everyone to take a look at this document either throughout the session or if you're comfortable uh, sometime after the session. Uh, so my plan today is to cover just one data set, but I've also included two others in the material sent. 
uh, where I do a lot more visualizations and I include some more tips and tricks along the way. Uh, if, especially if you're completely new, you don't have to master these skills at the end of the session, but instead my goal is that everyone feels like that with some practice, they can start analyzing and visualizing data using these free and amazing tools and it's not as overwhelming as it may seem at first. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to post them in the chat. I'll monitor and answer questions when I feel like there's a good uh, time. And if I miss someone, Paul will give me a little nudge. I'll also leave some time uh, at the end for questions around uh, the 10-ish minutes mark before one. Uh, and I'm happy to answer questions after one until about 1.30-ish. And if you have questions after this presentation, just like Paul said, please email him and uh, he'll gather questions and send them off to me. Uh, so the first thing I wanted uh, to do was ask everyone in the chat if you're comfortable to kind of, uh, you know, say what level of R you're in or programming, like beginner, intermediate, advanced, and maybe describe like in one sentence or something like why you're here. Uh, so I'd love to get a sense of like why people are interested in data visualization in R and maybe I can, uh, you know, throughout the demonstration, I can uh, specify or be specific from those, uh, from those polls. Uh, so yeah, whenever, whenever you're ready. Uh, but otherwise, uh, let's get started. So why use R? So first of all, R is a programming language, but it's not just that. It does have an entire ecosystem of tools and it's focused on statistics uh, and machine learning as well as graphing and plotting. So a majority of these tools are open source and are created uh, by a very large community. Uh, and that community is continuously growing. So I have um, a link here that shows that gives sort of like the, uh, I, I suppose it's an in, it's a rating percentage from this private company, but it gives like a good indication of how many people are using it uh, throughout the time. And you can see that there's this huge spike around uh, 2020. I suppose people were really interested in, in visualizing uh, COVID at this time, uh, but that's really interesting. Uh, so, uh, I've referred to the idea of sort of tools in, in R up to now, but I'm going to switch my language up a bit. The tools in R are technically referred to as packages. So a uh, package is the quote unquote fundamental uh, unit of shareable code. A uh, package will bundle together various functions and documentations to provide R users with friendly and reliable code. So if you're, uh, you know, coming in with some kind of problem, for example, like how can I plot a bar graph? You typically don't uh, you know, start from scratch trying to develop your own things. You typically go to the community and see like, oh, is, has someone else already figured this out? And it turns out when it comes to plotting, there's already a really great set of tools uh, and all you need to do is really like look at the instructions. So that's, and Packages are essentially why R is really great for beginners. And I see a lot of uh, people in the comments like saying total noob, I'm a beginner too. So I'm really, I'm really happy because that's, that's sort of the focus of this presentation. So uh, packages are essentially why R is good for beginners. As beginners, we don't necessarily need to know anything about what our code is doing. We kind of just need to follow the instructions and examples that are available through the package documentation. So let's go uh, into a few of the packages that we'll be using uh, for the demonstration. So the first big sort of combination of packages is called the Tidyverse. So I'll go to their website here. So the Tidyverse is uh, a collection of art packages designed for data science. They share an underlying philosophy, grammar, and data structure. And so when you use uh, sort of one package in the Tidyverse, you kind of get a sense of how the other packages work as well. So it's a really great place to start. 
and as you'll see, so these are some of the packages available. The first one I'd like to focus on is ggplot2. So ggplot2 is the package that we'll be using to plot our graphs. Um, and uh, uh, these are some other packages here. So for example, dplyr is the package that we'll be using to perform some data manipulation uh, before we put the things in our graph. Uh, each package has a uh, set of documentation. And because the tidyverse is such a mature package, uh, you know, a lot of work has been done to create like simple steps for everyone to follow, uh, including things like cheat sheets, um, for example. So if you ever kind of like forget how to do something, you can go into the documentation and see, you know, how to do it. Uh, and then, uh, and you'll you'll find that for every uh, package in the tidyverse. So some of them, some of these are going to be covering today. Uh, some of them I won't be, but they're really good to know in the future. Uh, uh, I also want to cover some of these. So these are really like uh, great um, packages uh, for other things. And I'm going to tell you right now, there's like, I think there's 14,000 different packages. So I've included a, a list here of, you know, if you ever get stuck on something and you think uh, there, there should be a package for it, there probably is. Uh, and uh, this list organizes it by, uh, by topic. So I suggest, so this deck is going to be available to everyone at the end. So I suggest you kind of like scroll through and see uh, what packages you're interested in doing uh, and working with. So uh, now that uh, we have like a good idea about what packages we're going to use for data visualization, let's take a look at the uh, data set we're going to unpack today. Uh, so it is called the new housing price index. So I chose it because it's a little topical, uh, but it's also a simple data set uh, to start with. So let's first uh, explore how StatsCan provides this data set to you. So we go into uh, its uh, StatsCan's page for this table, and we can see that StatsCan kind of gives you a slice of the data using their graphical interface, and we can kind of sort of select different slices. Uh, but since we're working with R, that's not necessarily how we want to access this data. Uh, instead of doing that, there's a download options here, and uh, there's different download options. We're going to focus on this CSV download the entire table new housing price index monthly. So this will bring up, so when you download this, you'll get it in a zipped file, and there's going to be two files in there. Uh, there's going to be uh, one CSV that is the actual table, and another CSV is the meta data information. We're just going to focus on the actual table here. Uh, and if you ever kind of like uh, want to know like what CSV is, it stands for comma separated value. And that just means that each value is separated by a comma and then each row is um, a new line uh, in this text. But, you know, if you're asking like, oh my gosh, how am I going to make like a plot out of this? That's exactly what we're going to use R for. And you'll see it's going to be a lot easier. It's not this like huge complicated thing. Um, so let's go back. So I've already downloaded the CSVs we need for this presentation. Um, so we don't actually have to download anything right now. Um, I also, before we go on into the actual demonstration, I wanted to show you like what the, uh, you know, what our final output is going to look like. Um, so this is it. And I kind of just wanted to add to the disclaimer that Paul mentioned in the beginning. I claim no kind of conclusions about the graph I, graphs I show today. I'm not a subject matter expert in the methodology of the survey. So according to my understanding, though, an index is a statistically weighted average. Uh, and in this case, it refers to prices of new homes. Um, so basically, they send out a survey to people involved in 
prices of housing, like people who just bought a house or uh, developers, and they answer the questions. And then StatsCan does a statistically weighted average depending on that survey. And then we get an index, which is like a good comparison across time of how expensive, um, like what the price of housing is. So we're going to start out. So this is the graph that we're going to create today from scratch. Um, and it is a simple line graph. It's got uh, dates as its X value, the index as its Y value. And I'm using a theme to make it look nice. And I'm um, like, I have a title and a subtitle as well as a caption to make sure that people know what this graph is and where it comes from. Uh, and also I wanted to show you, so although we'll, we'll just be doing a deep dive on this data set and this sort of graph, how to make this graph, I want to show you like how you can explore the data further by using data visualization. So here are some, some more graphs that you can create out of the data set. So you can split it by province, for example, uh, or you can zone in on a specific time frame. So like this is March, 2021. Uh, I'll also, so this is uh, something a little bit more complicated. It's called a facet graph. And basically, so for each little graph here, it's a province and then the date is, I think it's the last year and you can kind of see the index growth. So for example, you know, from January to February of 2020, um, Alberta, the Alberta index has risen just a little bit. Um, you can also from this data set get the census metropolitan area index growth and uh, you can also split that up between um, house only and land only index and I'll talk about that when we take a look at the data set a little bit further. Uh, I also wanted to show you some of my uh, favorite inspirations so like I said I suggest you take uh, some time to look at these as reference, especially this R graph gallery, because if you ever want to know, like, okay, how am I going to make this graph? Like, I want to make like a heat map or something complicated, something that seems complicated. This is a great place to go for that um, for that reference. So, for example, today we'll be making a line graph. So, what I like to do is I just like to go to line plot, and it'll give me like a series of different scenarios for line plotting. So for example, today we're gonna be dealing with dates. So I want, I do want to avoid struggling with dates on the X axis. So I'll take a look at some of the, like how this person in particular solved these problems. Um, yeah, uh, some other really nice things, uh, this blog, data wrapper, data viz, do's and don'ts, it's a little bit more general, uh, but it goes through like some design aspects and then one of my favorite places to get like inspirations for like sort of more po political or topical graphs that you know sh show uh, a story through data visualization is uh, ProRepublica's graph and graphics and data section. Uh, so these are not made in R, but they're good for kind of inspiration into how we tell a story through data. Okay, um, yeah, so let's begin. So I've included some instructions on how to install. So you need to do two things if you want it R on your local computer. So first you want to install R itself, and you also want to install something called R Studio. So R Studio is an integrated developer environment, and that's where I'm going to be working in for our demo today. Um, and it's pretty much so like other programming languages have a bunch of different ways uh, people like to work on them but our studio in our studio like that's what you use for R. so it's a pretty simple choice to make uh, and if you're not comfortable downloading these things onto your computer you can also work uh, in your browser by going to our studio cloud and when you log in uh, and if you want to use the projects that I show you today, you can um, create a new project from the Git repository. And I believe uh, that was sent out in the email. Um, so you just have to put in that um, 
uh, that URL and you'll be good to go. Otherwise- In the chat want, as well. Yeah, in the chat as well. Thank you, Paul. Uh, oh, can we get the data using API? Yes. So if you're talking specifically about uh, StatsCan data, yes, there is a web API. And in the material that I provided, I've created, um, so I, I have a little uh, line of code that will download um, what's, what StatsCan calls the all cube uh, metadata list, as well as uh, a function that helps you um, download data if you have the product ID, uh, which was um, this number in the bottom right that's associated with each table, uh, you can download it directly. So definitely make sure to check out some of the material I sent um, where like I, I use that, I use the API as an example. Um, Yeah, and there's some more instructions on on the deck, which which will be sent out. Um, so yeah, let's get right into it. So I'm I'm actually going to close this, and I'm going to go into my R Studio environment. So again, if you're comfortable, you can follow along with me. But if not, please just watch. Uh, this is recorded, so you can uh, when it's published, you can go back and watch this again. Uh, the best way I can describe the learning process for, for this type of thing uh, is that it's like a series of hurdles, but once you get through each one, it kind of seems like obvious when you look back. So I'm kind of, I'll tell you when like the next set of things is gonna be complicated. I'll give you a warning, but uh, I know that like after you kind of get familiar with these concepts, it's kind of like, it, it seems obvious looking back. So when we open our studio, we'll see a few different panes. So this pane is called the console. Uh, this is really where the magic happens. This is where R is going to be executed. And what that means is that it sends instructions to the computer, your computer does them, and then it prints out the results. In the bottom right over here, uh, this is your file pane. Pretty simple, it's just like your file explorer. It'll list out the file in your current uh, directory, uh, which just means folder. Um, the pane also has a few other tabs that are going to be really helpful for today. So the first one is plots. So this is where plots will show up when you call to them. And uh, the other pane is help. And this is, so we're already on a help page here. This is where you can find uh, documentation within your RStudio space. Uh, very quickly. And I'll, I'll go through that uh, in more detail a little later. Uh, in the top right, so this is getting a little bit more complicated. This is your environment pane. I'll leave it at that for now, but I will go through it uh, in a bit. Uh, and okay, let's, let's just get started. So when you print stuff here, uh, like I said, uh, your computer will kind of evaluate it and then print it out. So uh, for example, if I just type in hello, computer says hello back, uh, pretty simple evaluation. Uh, I can do like simple arithmetic in, in the pane and it'll print it back. The one here means that it's like the first line or the first element, uh, not too important. Uh, so you can do arithmetic. Uh, you can also evaluate uh, other things. So for example, if I wanted to say, you know, does one value equal, is one value identical to another value? So for example, is five identical to four? Um, and you can see this is, this is two equal operator. That just means identical. Um, and it'll return false as we'd expect. So um, this is, where the magic happens, like I said, um, it's where the computer does its thing. Uh, so the next thing I wanna introduce you to is call, are called functions. So the first function that we're gonna use is the round function. So, and as you might expect, 
it will round a number up or down depending on the digits. So for example, 10.9 will round up to 11 or you know, round 9.2 will round down to nine. So uh, a function will sort of have a very common um, pattern. So it's going to be the function name round and then in brackets, so in these parentheses, um, it's going to be where you place what that what you want that function to evaluate. So in this case, it's a number. So see what 9.5 happens. So in this case of round, uh, we're putting in one value, which is the number that we want to evaluate, and it's giving us back um, the rounded number. But in case we wanted to, let's say, specify the amount of digits, we know that the next, um, so you can see that in fact, our studio is helping us out here, telling us that the next argument is the digits argument where we can specify those digits. So let's say we have 9.64 uh, or something like that. And we want it to go to the first digit it's not going to round it to uh, 10 anymore. It's going to round it to the first digit because we specified that. So this may have been uh, a little tedious, but essentially what's going to happen when we get to it is that we'll essentially just create a plot by calling a function. So we'll do something like this, where we uh, call the function ggplot, which is going to make our plot. And then we do we put in some kind of arguments in here. We'll talk about what needs to be put in here to make a plot correctly. And then when we press enter, it's going to return a plot. Uh, okay, so the next thing I wanted to explain is this global environment. So this is kind of like a next hurdle. Um, so when we, want to assign values to variables. Uh, for example, I want to assign the value five to a variable x, like so. Uh, we use something that's known as the assignment operator. In R, the assignment operator is this greater than dash symbol. So what we're telling R to do is assigning five to x. And now x becomes stored in memory with the value five. And we can call on x and it will return five. And R makes it simple to know what's in our environment, what's stored in our memory with this environment pane. So we know here that the uh, value is five. Now each value, so each variable needs to be unique. So for example, if I uh, assign x a different uh, value, uh, the value will change, it will be overwritten. I can also assign, let's say, y a value. Oops, sorry. Let's say y equals five. And I can do the same basic operations as before, but with variables like that. So the next big hurdle is, so we've been all, we've all been doing this in uh, a console. Uh, but we can easily lose our work in the console. So what we actually do want to do is do all our work in an R script. So we open it up, we press R script, and then before we do anything, I like to save. So I'm just going to save this R script. Uh, I'm going to call it presentation.r. And now it's saved in our uh, current folder. And we can do everything that we did before. So we can create uh, a variable, so like so, uh, and call and create other variables. But now we can save the script, we can close it, we can kind of return back to it and not worry about the console clearing. Um, some tricks in the script is that you can run one line at a time using uh, this. You can also select uh, like you can just select all of the things that you want to run and run them at the same time. Uh, and then the other trick is that if you want to write code, if you want to write something in your script that you don't want to be evaluated, you start, you begin with this hashtag symbol 
and you can write comments here and comments aren't evaluated um, at all. So for example, if I do round y, uh, you won't see that popping up, but if I copy round y over here, you'll see that round y has been evaluated. Okay, so our next hurdle is going to be installing and loading packages. So the first thing that we wanna do when we work with a package is install it. Uh, thankfully, we only need to install a package one time. It's kind of like an application that you might install like Chrome or something. Um, and, uh, but we do need to call to that, uh, to that package whenever we wanna use a script. So for example, let's say I wanna install the tidyverse. So first of all, let's go into uh, the instructions that the tidyverse gives you because they're really, they're really helpful in this case. So for example, install the package in the tidyverse by running install packages. And you can see that this is the way we install a package is running a install packages function. Uh, and then we specify the tidyverse as an argument in this function. And so what we might wanna do here is install packages tidyverse. So I'm not gonna run that because I have tidyverse installed, but once you run it, it'll tell you, you know, if the package installed successfully. And you only ever need to do that one time. Uh, but what you do need to do to make sure that you have available in each script is make sure that you've loaded the packages uh, that you use in uh, at the top of your script. Uh, and you want to do that because whenever you close R, these values here will disappear. Uh, you basically, when you close R uh, Studio, uh, you need to um, uh, call upon the things that you've used in your previous session, including any packages that you've used. Uh, just want so, you to time check here, it's uh, 1234. Sure, thank you, Paul. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so now we know how to uh, load the tidyverse package we'll be using for our uh, analysis. So once we press run, uh, don't worry about these warning messages I just need to upgrade my R version, um, but the package is loaded. So the first function that we want to use out of this package is called read CSV. And uh, what this is going to do is going to read our CSV uh, that we've downloaded from StatsCam. So we're going to want to do read underscore CSV. And the argument for this function is a quoted file name. So in quotes, we want to write 18100205.csv. And we're going to run this function. And I'm going to show you what happens. Yeah, 206 there. Oh, yeah. OK. <laughs> Thanks. OK. We're going to run this function. And we can see it show up here. But we don't really want it in our console. We actually want it as a variable in, in our environment. So what we're going to do is uh, uh, we're going to name this CSV, I like to do lowercase, uh, give it a good name. Uh, and then I like to name things base for when I'm first loading it in. That tells me that this is like the first time I've loaded in my data set. And then I never, I don't touch it. I um, kind of build off of it. So once we run this, um, we'll actually see that it appears in our global environment right over here. And a quick way to kind of see what's in here is to click on it. And you'll see that uh, it gets loaded in and we can take a look at what's actually in here. It's not that mess from before. We actually have sort of column and values and we kind of get a sense of what's going on. Um, right. So now um, we want to clean up this data set. There's a lot going on here that we don't really need. For example, this ID code, um, 
it's sort of it corresponds to this geography, but we don't we don't really need it. Uh, other other people might. So we're gonna we're gonna drop this column, and there's a lot of columns here that we're gonna drop that we don't need. Uh, but what we do need is this ref date, uh, this geo column because we want to specify Canada, uh, the new housing price indices. Uh, these are, this is a column that refers to the type. So we have total house and land, house only, land only. Um, and then we, the other one we want is the value column, uh, which is the actual index. And if, if you're familiar with StatsCan, this is actually, um, uh, what's it called? This is actually like a very consistent format. So whenever you download a data set, it will probably have these columns here and then the actual value is stored in the values data set. So this is called a, uh, like an aggregated data set, um, not a granular one. So what we do from here is we want to select these columns. So what do we do? Well, there's a handy function from the dplyr package called select. So Let's create a new variable to store our new table in. And I'm going to call it housing prices select. So I usually suffix, I usually take the, the, the name uh, to be the same as what we've loaded. But then as a suffix, I'll say this is you know, what I did at this stage. And we're going to use the select function just like we did before. And our select function, I want to show you a quick way to see um, to look at the documentation. So if you type in question mark and then select in the console, a helper uh, will, will go here and it'll tell you uh, select and optionally rename variables in a data frame using a concise language that makes it easy to refer to date variables on, uh, on their name. So, the first argument of this select option is the table that you actually want to select from. So the table that we want to actually select from is housing prices base. And then the next arguments are going to be uh, the variables, or sorry, the column names that we want from the table. So we want ref date, we want geo, we want new housing price indices, and we want value. So ref date. Uh, sorry, geo. And so R doesn't like spaces. Uh, in order to uh, combat spaces, you have to do these things called a backtick. Um, it's close to your escape key. So you do new housing price indices to refer to that column. And then uh, value. So you can see that I've kind of gone pretty far to the right here. Uh, so our studio actually gives you a little indication of how much it recommends you go off to the right. Um, so R doesn't care about white spaces. So you can put in as many uh, carriage returns and spaces and tabs as you want. So to make this nice and concise, I'm just going to press enter here and make these align together so that I keep it uh, nice and organized. And now uh, when we run this function, we're going to see that uh, our new table has uh, the same amount of observations, but it's only four variables, which is exactly what we wanted. And that's great. So the next thing that we want to do is um, let's uh, talk about data types. So this is the next big hurdle. So if we go, if we select this little arrow icon here, we can see that we can see each column with the column name. And then we can see uh, what data type it is. So ref date is a character, geo is a character, uh, new housing price index is a character, and value is a number. And that's great. We want value to be a number and we want new housing price indices to be a character because it's uh, just a bunch of um, 
you know, letters and strings. Uh, we want geo to be a character for the same reason. And, uh, but we don't want ref date to be a character because there's actually a data type in R called date. We want to transform ref date into something more useful. Ooh, I can see that I'm running out of time. So we want to um, put, uh, so we're going to make a new variable and we're going to do something called mutate. Uh, 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 the, we're going to do something called mutate a function. Sorry, we're going to use the function mutate to change our date column into a, an act, uh, a column with uh, the data type date. Ooh, is a mouthful. All right, so this is the next one. And let's call upon our uh, helper function here to see just exactly what this mutate function does. So create, modify, and delete columns. So that's exactly what we want to do. We want to modify a column. So we put in, just like before, our uh, table that we want to modify. Housing prices select. And then um, what we want to modify is the ref date column. And in this case, uh, we want it to be a date. So for time reasons, I was going to explain, uh, um, what's it called? I was going to explain how to, you know, what this means, but unfortunately I, I, I'm running out of time. So I'm going to just go uh, through it. And then I'll, if I have time at the end, I'll explain if anyone has questions out on it. So we're going to change uh, this date variable um, into an actual variable with the date type. So now we can see when we go into our uh, thing, we can see that this has changed into a date, which is exactly what we want. Okay, on to actually plotting this thing. Let's do it. So when we do plots, I want to make a plot variable just like I did with these. So I'm going to create housing prices plot. Um, and sorry, there's there's actually one more thing I forgot to mention. We need to uh, filter uh, because if we take a look at, let's go back to date here. Uh, we see that we have a bunch of geographies here. So not only do we have Canada, but we also have provinces and we also have CMAs, so cen uh, census metropolitan areas. And then in new housing price index, we kind of just care about total house and land. Uh, we don't care for house only or land only right now. Uh, so what we want to do is filter uh, these values to just be Canada and total. And so just like I uh, said, uh, there's a function for that. So the function is filter. Uh, and we're going to take our table that we want to filter. And we want to filter for geo. So we want it to, and, and in this case, we don't use equals because we're not assigning it. Uh, rather, we use the identity assignment operator, the identity operator, and we go Canada. And then we do the same thing for new housing price indices. So again, we need to use the back tick. I'm just going to copy and paste. And we want to go, I need to type this in exactly. So I'm just going to copy and paste here. Uh, there's a parenthesis. And now when we run this, we'll see that our new table only has those values, which is exactly what we want. So now let's plot this graph. So we're going to make a plot variable to store it in. And then, uh, like I said before, we're going to call on to ggplot. So ggplot accepts uh, data. So our data set that we want to use is this one, right? Oops, right here. 
And then it ex our next thing that ggplot wants in order to make a, ta uh, a plot is our x and y variables. So for x, we're going to do uh, ref date. And for y, we're going to do uh, value because value is our index. And then, so the next, this next part, it's part of kind of not knowing exactly what the code is doing, but just like trusting that you can follow the instructions. Uh, we're going to add this plus symbol. What we're doing is we're adding um, a, an object to our uh, to our plot um, variable. So right now we've set it up, but now we want to make sure that it comes out as a line graph. So we go geom line, and that's all we need to add. So when we run this housing plot, we see it in our variable list. And then now we want to print it out, just like we printed out the other variables like x and so forth. So we just type it in here. And you'll see that it shows up. Look at that. We have our very first plot. Um, yeah. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to see, I'm going to scroll through some of the questions. Oh, okay. There are no questions for me to scroll through. That's all. Just, uh, let me know if you need me to repeat something. Yeah, go ahead. Just Paul. one. Uh, what does AES stand for from Darren? Ah, yeah. Good, 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 good call. Um, so AES, uh, so actually let's, let's figure that out by using a combination of two things. So first is we're going to type it in to our console here with the question mark. Oh. And it says construct aesthetic mappings. So this is essentially how ggplot wants you to input your x, y variable. And there's going to be other variables. There's going to be other um, things like fill and color. And in order to figure out how to use that, we need to go to our um, documentation here. So if we go to the ggplot documentation uh, and we go to reference, and we go into the ggplot function itself, it'll tell you how it wants you to initialize this function. And there are examples. Uh, so this is pretty much uh, you know, exactly what we did. So we call ggplot, we have our table name, then we call our aesthetic mapping, and uh, that's the x axis mapping, that's the y-axis mapping. And then we've added, they've added a geom point, which is like uh, a scatter, a scatter plot. Um, and then another uh, geom point, which they've done to qualify. So like th those are the red geom points here. And they uh, are associated with mean. So, uh, you know, it was a great question because they got us to look through the documentation and that's essentially what you'll be doing as you create your graphs um, is looking through like documentation and seeing other people's examples and then uh, writing your own code. So, um, you know, what I, you know, encourage you to do is I've given, you know, uh, you a lot of examples on how to go through different data sets uh, from StatsCan, uh, like from start to finish, exactly what we did now. Um, so I'll end off with one more demonstration, and that's going to be how do we add labels to this graph? So we've created a graph here. So first of all, we can zoom in to this graph. So we press zoom, we can kind of, it'll open a different uh, window and we can make it bigger. Uh, we can also export it like so, with uh, this function here. Uh, so how do we add labels? Uh, so there's a great way to add labels. So all you have to do is call the function labs to the end of your ggplot. And then you want to do, let's say you want to add a title. So our title from before was something like new housing prices index. 
So let's run that again and then call it again. And we can see that la that label has been passed through. And it's pretty simple. So same with subtitle, uh, say Canada. There you go. Um, yeah, that's, that's about uh, the demonstration. Uh, if you want to go even further, so let's say, you know, I don't really like to look at this graph as it is. I want to customize it some way. Um, you know, how can I customize it? Well, you can either, you know, write a bunch of customizations for it, or there's some really great um, packages that other people have written already. Uh, for example, one is called GD Themes. And they've already included a bunch of different, you know, theming elements uh, that you can use in your own graph without having to uh, make your own. So my different, uh, uh, my favorite uh, theme is called Theme Pander. So the first thing we want to do is load in GD Themes so that we can use it in our script, and then uh, we go Theme Pander at the end. And there we go. We didn't have to do anything. It's it's all there. So th that's that happens to be my favorite theme, but you can use any theme uh, you want in that package. And you can find other packages with, with more themes. Uh, so at this point, what I want to do is I want to point to more resources uh, where you can find uh, rated uh oh, that. I'm going to put a word in here. Uh, yeah, of course. Michael and I have been working on this for a while, and he's actually simplified it to the point where uh, even last night or yesterday, I was a little bit intimidated, but I was able to follow along with that and it demystifies things. And to know that the rest of it is just like that, like building blocks in a way, uh, makes me want to tackle other visualizations. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, this is a deck I think is going to be really useful. Uh, it's a bunch of resources, so free resources to uh, you know where to look further. Um, so I said, you know, highly encourage everyone to to take a look. Uh, the, these are written by the people that you know have made R, so they're they're really comprehensive, and they're made for beginners as well. And uh, with that, I'll finish off uh, my presentation. Thank you very much. So the floor is open, as I mentioned before, to questions. We can go uh, past the hour, uh, and this recording will be uh, made available, along with the slides themselves. And if Michael wants to throw in any uh, thing in the notes field, uh, that, that, uh, that would be welcome. We'll send it around, say, Monday for everything. One of the best things about this, I think, is that it's free. I mean, obviously, donations are encouraged, just as they are to the society, uh, but it is not uh, an expensive package as some other competitors uh, are, are want to be. Uh, isn't that right, Michael? Oh, that's correct. And and sorry, not only is it is it free, but because there's such a large community, there's always different packages going out. So for example, like when you go into like proprietary software like SAS or SPASS, like you only get what they that company, that private company puts out, right? Uh, but with R, there's there's a lot more and people are constantly adding stuff, which is great. I like to think that getting some fluency or facility with R and being able to demonstrate it in just the manner that was demonstrated today uh, would be more than enough to qualify one for some of the more entry level uh, data science or data analysis uh, jobs and just get, get going on it. Um, there are many, many tutorials on, on YouTube I found with a cursory search even. And uh, I, I like to think that we'll be able to do more with this in the future. Um, you know, show like if we are doing our own visualizations at the society, we can show our steps, so to speak. And then people can uh, mix and match and take them. 
Um, any 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 questions from from anybody at this point? Okay. Uh, in that case, I will just uh, once again uh, ask everyone to consider joining the society as a member. Uh, we've got the summit coming up on September 15th and 16th. Uh, we will continue to have webinars monthly uh, before and afterwards. Uh, we'll be electing half of our board uh, of directors at that point. Uh, we're on a two-year rotation. Uh, there's many opportunities as a member to vote, to serve on the board, to be on committees, our, including our advocacy committee, uh, our um, events committee, and uh, well, just a lot of uh, good, useful work. Uh, yes, um, again, the recording will be available to everyone. I started right with a disclaimer slide, so we're just going to put a a nice block on the front and then it's off to the races um yeah and your your actually your membership dues uh help us put together things like this uh, help us pay for uh, the website zoom uh, other things as needed um if there's uh, nothing else uh then maybe i will uh close the proceedings uh, a couple of minutes early